Good afternoon, good morning, depending upon where you are in the world. Welcome to the National Women's Collaborative Women's Wednesday Series. My name is Sharon Jackson. I am president and co-founder of this amazing organization. And I will say that it's amazing because just three short years ago, we started with three women that wanted to get together, to work together, to collaborate, to fuss about issues, complain, just get together and be everything for and about women. And I'm happy to say as of today that we have over 2,600 women that have joined the collaborative. So if you're new to our organization, you can find us on Facebook, join us. We would love to talk to, talk to you and work with you. But you know, just to give you a little bit of history about what the National Women's Collaborative is, if you've been on one of our series, you hear me say this all the time, the National Women's Collaborative was started accidentally on purpose. And I say that because originally we were a downtown DC based organization where we had an office space where we were gonna have women come to our office to work together, to collaborate, but it was all about DC women. And then this was in February, 2020. And we had done this huge marketing campaign to get our women to come to our office, to host events, meetings, and, you know, just basically to work together. Well, that was February, 2020, March, 2020, we closed our doors, our, our physical doors, but not our gold doors. So what happened is that women kept emailing us and wanting to be part of the collaborative and we didn't know what to do with them. Quite honestly, we weren't experts in any of it. We weren't experts in HR, insurance, financial literacy, none of it. So what we did, we turned the collaborative into a private Facebook group. As a result of that, we were now no longer a DC-based organization. We are now global. We have four, four countries that are represented in our organization and women throughout throughout the United States and Puerto Rico, and I mean, just the world actually. So what we decided to do, we ho host a Women's Wednesday series, for which you're a part of today. We kick off the third Wednesday of every month. And so this is our first one for 2024. And we are going to talk about AI's impact on HR. Now I have to tell you, I was sharing with a colleague today, I was typing an email and before I could hit send, this little icon popped up and said, would you like to rewrite with AI? And I was mm -hmm. like, if this going to charge me, no. So, <laughs> so I hit it and it rewrote my email that was better than the way I had written it. So I'm thinking, heck, you don't have to think at all anymore. <laughs> okay. AI is taking over. So today we have three amazing badass women that are come talk to us about all things AI and HR trends and what's happening, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And, you know, I could really read their resumes and tell you what school they went to, where they live and all that kind of stuff. But I am a firm believer that no one could talk about themselves better than themselves. So I'm gonna start with one of our panelists Dr. Vicki Sanchez, who is, uh, okay, for those of us that are on the East Coast or the Midwest of the United States, we're mad at her because she's in Puerto Rico and it's 85 <laughs> degrees. But Dr. Sanchez, I have to say that Dr. Sanchez has been with the National Women's Collaborative since we started. I was in Puerto Rico looking for various women to uh, participate on our panels. I sent her an email, we had a phone conversation. She met me at the hotel and we've been friends ever since. So we're gonna start with Dr. Vicki and then we're gonna to go to Sabrina. Sabrina's uh, writing from the greater Boston area. I'm proud to say that Sabrina uh, participated in our We Mean Business Summit last year in Puerto Rico. Uh, she can share a little bit about that. And then Dr. Alicia. So I'm again, looking for women. And I'm, you know, searching women to be a part of our panelists. And I, I ran across, I ran across Dr. Alicia. So we started talking and I said, wait a minute, 
I know you. I worked with you 20 years ago when she worked with the Stemmy Graham or uh, so, uh, Stemmy Graham and Associates. And so that's our panelists. And that's how this all happens. It, it's by sisterhood. It's by love. It's by dedication. And it's by determination. So again, welcome, ladies. And we'll start with you, Dr. Vicki. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from the beautiful Puerto Rico. I say hello to everyone. Thank you for the invitation, Sharon. As always, it's a pleasure to continue supporting the National Women um, Collaborative and um, exchange ideas and grow a network as a female and, uh, and a leader and a business owner. I think that this is what where we grow and where we learn from each other and support each other. Um, I know it's very difficult. These are challenging times and having and being part of this network has been very beneficial and has allowed me to, you know, get to know um, power level women and mindful women that can, you know, support each other. So um, I live in Puerto Rico. I am an HR um, consultant and I provide services to a small and medium businesses here in Puerto Rico, but also in U.S. And um, I have been in HR for almost 20 years. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, and um, I also a professor at university locally. So um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward for this conversation. Wonderful, Sabrina. Hi, thank you. I, um, I absolutely uh, follow what Dr. Vicki said. I appreciate the invitation. I love being here. Um, and I was excited to find the National Women's Collaborative last year because my passion in my human resources consulting business is to help women who own businesses to do more and, and achieve their dreams and help take away a lot of those HR worries and stuff. And I've been doing HR since the late 90s and have seen the changes and the trends and all of the crazy things that have gone on and it and I've never lost my passion for it so I love being here and again thank you so much and I'm coming out of um, greater Boston actually up in New Hampshire but spent most of my career in Los Angeles California so I've got bi-coastal HR experience all right Dr. Alicia well, good morning and, and good afternoon, everyone. I am in the Chicagoland area where it is one degrees outside. So uh, I have no idea why anybody will be walking <laughs> outside or going anywhere. Uh, but thank you, Sharon, uh, for this invitation. And she was correct. We started a conversation when she reached out to me halfway through. She said, stop, hold it. I know you. I'm like, yes, we know one another. And it is such a pleasure to be able to be a part of this panel. I've spent 20 years working for Statman Graham, a uh, nonprofit organization where I uh, was the managing director and the uh, HR uh, director at that time. And fast forward 10 years now, I've been uh, actually going on 11 years next month. I uh, do a lot of uh, strategic HR and leadership development and, and nonprofit management for my clients here within Chicago and outside of the Chicagoland area as well. Um, just like the other ladies, Sabrina and Dr. Vicki, helping uh, women who have businesses um, ease their pain uh, and help them strategy wise when it comes to running an effective business so that they can grow. And so I'm looking forward to this panel today. So thank you again for the invitation. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, you know, let's jump right in. And again, if you want to add something, although the question is not directed to you, please feel free to um, jump right in. And for those that are joining us, if you could put what city you're representing in the chat, as well as your LinkedIn prof um, profile that or Facebook profile, whatever you like to do, because we do like for our women to connect. And so Although this panel is on HR, if there is something else that's coming up where you have an expertise, watch out. You may be hearing from me, okay? <laughs> all right, so let's jump right in. But we all know that HR tools, as I shared er earlier, are being adopted by HR and management at almost an alarming rate. You know, um, and, you know, Dr. Alicia, in your opinion, what are the pros of using these kind of tools? 
So, you know, that's a good question. And, and you know, I spent some time thinking about it. Uh, so what came to mind to me first is change is inevitable, right? And if you're in business, you'll understand what I mean by that. And so we have to embrace change no matter what. Uh, but when it comes to AI, you know, artificial intelligence and HR, you have to sit back and say, okay, this is a tool. Like you go get your new phone, whatever it is that you go get, right? And you sit back and you have to say, how can this tool now help me become better or more efficient? And so when I think about AI and HR, I come up with like three bullet points that I thought about um, when you think about, and there's two parts to HR, you know, there's the HR administration and there's HR leadership, you know, more strategic um, for business. And so efficiency was one of the ones I come up with that's a pro. Uh, because if you are in a large business and you have thousands of employees, well, you want to be more automated and more efficient um, and with some of those routine tasks. Like if you have to screen 500 resumes, well, you need AI for that to help you screen those. Um, or if it's initial candidate assessments that you want to do. Uh, so think about that uh, as a pro when it comes to AI and HR. My second one is uh, more data driven, right? And so if you, again, if you're in HR, um, HR leaders, strategically, we wanna get data uh, to help us make decisions, right? You must make decisions based on your data. Uh, and so AI can help you analyze that. Now, again, if you know the small organization got, you know, less than 50 employees or uh, less than 100, 200, you may use another tool uh, other than AI, because it may not be that beneficial, uh, but someone like uh, Amazon or Microsoft or companies, these Fortune 500 have businesses all over the world, or, uh, components, AI would be very beneficial for them in the HR department. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, my third point I will probably bring up is improved candidate experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone is looking for a better experience when you're interviewing with the company. And I'm sure we all can agree. We probably all have an experience where we thought, hmm, this is the human resource department. I haven't heard from anyone. Uh, and so you can use it more effectively in that way where you can add a virtual assistance uh, to enhance that experience, uh, to take off the load. So that was one time, I'm gonna date myself, where the phone would ring a lot in HR, right? Now, fast forward in the 90s and the 20th century, it was emails. Now we're getting out of all these emails and now we have this new tool, AI, that we can create a virtual assistance. So I think for me, those three bullet points would be a pro to how you can embrace AI. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, Sabrina, are you finding that some of these tools that some of these organizations are using have a greater impact on women or uh, people of color, especially those that are seeking employment? I, I do. And, and I think it actually has a, there's like a two pronged impact depending on whether you're internal in an organization that's using AI inside it, like Dr. Alicia spoke about having automation tools versus being an outside candidate coming into a company. I do find, my experience has been that oftentimes AI, even though they claim to be less biased, is more biased against women and people of color when it's for someone coming from outside of an organization, largely because those systems, they're only as good as what you put in them, right? Just like a computer, garbage in, garbage out. So if you have somebody putting stuff in that uses gendered terms or they look at gendered names or 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 schools, right? You can get a lot of, of discrimination if you like only target specific schools because those schools are not necessarily great at having a broad mix of people and that can be detrimental. But on the other side, there are a number of women in tech that are building platforms using AI to get rid of that. You know, I, I've met with a few that are working to have non-biased talent platforms 
where they take away specific names of jobs and mm -hmm. schools and they extrapolate out, again, using the AI technology, better ways of communicating what those people are capable of. And if companies are open and, and HR leaders are open to working with those platforms, I think that AI can actually be beneficial down the road for hiring people who can do the work and not hiring people who look or sound just like the hiring manager. Well, well you know, I think, uh, thank you, Sabrina. <clears throat> you know, this is not necessarily AI, but I do think it's all about technology. But, you know, Dr. Vicki, um, you know, how many of us have gone to, uh, you know, a restaurant and we sit down, we order on this little device and all the person does is bring us our food and they want to tip, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you never engage with anyone. Or the new thing, or not just relatively new, is the self-service for me. You, you can tell what my pet peeves are, right? So <laughs> but the self-service, self-checkout at stores. Okay. If I have to do the work, I got to scan it, pay for it, and put it in the bag. I think you should lower your prices. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I'm a doctor, you know, a lot of workers, especially entry level workers, feel that with all of this artificial intelligence, especially in the hiring process, it's displacing a lot of those workers. Are you finding that trend to be true in Puerto Rico or how is it affecting, you know, especially entry level employees? Yeah, it's an interesting topic. As as we navigate this, mm -hmm. a lot of people has a lot of concerns, and um, especially those entry level position, as Dr. Alicia mentioned, um, those um, tactical or operational roles that are very transactional are being or could be impacted. And we know as the trends and the future of work are showing the data is that basically those roles somehow will be impacted, but at the end, we'll still need people. You know, AI is going to um, be used as a tool, but we, we need that human factor as part of the equation. But um, as an example, we were this, um, this long weekend um, to a restaurant, as you mentioned, there, there was no waiters. Um, and um, at the end, they request a tip. And we will basically, you know, receive the food from 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 the chef directly. So, but those are the things that are, are actually changing in terms of the environment. But still, um, that's where companies and employer needs to um, effectively communicate what will be the impact on their organization and in their industry, how they are going to use AI, and what a specific task. It will be replaced by that tool, um, yet how we are going to continue leveraging and using human resources um, in order to effectively still communicating and engaging and in, in, in achieving our overall goals, um, especially in retail, food service industry, and customer service that we know that they are using a lot of chatbots and you are basically having conversations with a AI and machines, but it's still, if something is not working and you need customer support, the expectation is that you will have a conversation with a human being um, in order to find a resolution. So um, it, it, it is still limited adoption in some of the uh, industry, but others as you know, technology companies uh, will move quicker in terms of the implementation. Right. You know, we were going to talk about, you know, the biases that, you know, if a company historical, like, like you said, Sabrina, garbage in, garbage out, if they don't change that, then yeah, we know that it does lead to a lot of bias, a lot of discrimination, but we know that it is very helpful in the recruiting process, right? Especially for larger organizations, as you mentioned, Dr. Alicia. But, you know, Dr. Vicky. You know, and not just Puerto Rico, but are you seeing some positive trends in the recruiting process for when they're using some of these AI tools? I mean, so like, are you finding that they, they get better, you know, they can seek out better candidates that they may not have done if they had a job fair, which I don't even know if those still exist, but you know, um, 
So are there some positive trends? Yeah, definitely. I think that Sabrina mentioned it. Um, I think that you you could use AI just to eliminate bias um, or reduce it. Let, let's say it <laughs> because it's still uh, if the people that program has bias, they will use the tool with <laughs> bias. You know, so it's difficult. But but the the intention, if you're trying to eliminate that, the tool will help you um, identify diverse talent. Mm-hmm. And as we move in the new, uh, you know, future of work, you have seen many companies eliminating the education requirement, and they are not looking in terms of address because of globally now you can have um, people working from different um, countries and locations. So you will have a di- diverse pool of talent that actually is is very beneficial because it brings new ideas, new concepts. And also will help you with your DNI uh, metrics and and achieve those you know your your the company mission and, and purpose to have a, a a more diverse talent pool. So I think yeah, definitely it, it will simplify and 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 reduce the bias. Uh, but still, we you need know. to monitor the ethical uh, implication of that also. Right, right. You know, uh, it's so funny because. You know, I get all these emails, especially on LinkedIn. You know, are you interested in this position? We are seeking this person at LinkedIn and Facebook in particular. And so every now and then I'll click just because I'm curious. And then they want me to fill out all this information. And I'm like, you came to me. (laughs) So, so, you know, that, that takes me to sort of like personalized onboarding. And so... You know, Sabrina, there there used to be a time when, you know, you got hired for a job, you would go in and you would fill out all the paperwork and they would onboard you and say, welcome to Amazon. And now what they're doing, they're doing a lot of personalized onboarding. So what are the pros and cons of that? I mean, should it be, you know, one size fit all or should it be, should it be more personalized? Yeah, I so practically it, it's hard like this is actually where the AI comes in very positively, I think, because practically it's hard for a large organization to have customized onboarding, right? They might be higher or starting 10, 15, 20 people in, in a day or and every week they're doing the same thing. And it's really difficult to make that a personalized situation if it's having to be managed or run by one human. Um, I remember doing that back in the 90s at a big entertainment company where we'd have 10 new people starting every Monday and I was the orientation leader and it was very, you know, cookie cutter and that doesn't serve anybody. I really strongly believe in um, personalized onboarding. I think you set the person who's starting up for success and I think you set the company up for better success when you do that. And it is a case where I do think leveraging AI tools and automation can be a real beneficial um, part of that employee experience. And that's sort of where I was talking earlier about it's a very vastly different experience, whether you're inside a company versus outside a company. And I really think it sets people up for success if they have that access internally in a company. Uh, Dr. Alicia, what's your opinion on that? You know, so as I, you know, am listening to it, so yes, I I really do think that recruitment process can be prone to discrimination and alienation to the person who is applying. Uh, And of course, there are just several pros and cons to this process. And so, you know, one, the the bias come in, as, you know, uh, Dr. Vicky and Sabrina has said that, historical data, uh, and also the person who's putting this information in. And then the number one thing that I think we all have just said, the loss of human touch, uh, that, that's the, that's a big uh, consequence uh, for the AI. And you cannot um, lose that. Again, it's called human resources for a reason. Um, and so you really need that when it's time to make a decision for something. See, AI can't make a decision. It can only automate what you put in there for a response. Um, and here's an example. A couple of weeks ago, I Xfinity, I was just back and forth. I was like, oh, okay, I'm AI. And so, but they can't solve the problem. 
they can only keep asking you get the same question. I'm like, okay, I'm really upset now at this point, but I need to talk to a human being. So that's my example that you can't take that away uh, from human resources. And then finally, my third point under this was over-reliance on technology. You simply can't do that in human resources. I don't think you can do it anywhere else, but I know for a fact, you have to know when it's time for human judgment and intuition in the hiring process. You have to go beyond sometimes some of that data and look at that applicant. Uh, one of the processes that I use with some of my clients when they bring me in and I'm overseeing the HR and it's recruiting, move the addresses and the names. And I send it over to the hiring manager. Take a look at this candidate. And so, but those are things that AI can't do um, more effectively than a person who is actually looking at it and say, wait a minute, we keep getting the same candidates. And, and so you want to diversify the people coming in. You got to go back and look what's wrong. Uh, again, we go back to the historical data that was put in. So those are kind of really my three uh, cons when it comes to AI and the recruitment process. Sharon, you're on mute. So this is why I don't like playing with computers. But, <laughs> so, but I would say, you know, I mean, this is absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, it, there's so much to untangle with this. And we know that we can't do it, you know, in an hour. And we know that by the time we say something today, Tomorrow it would have changed. So, so we realized that. But <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, after George Floyd, um, we saw I mean, there wasn't a major company out there, even some smaller companies that did not implement DE and I programs. Everybody jumped on that. You know, we saw more people of color on television than we ever did. Okay. So, and every advertising campaign, whatever the case may be. But also with the downturn of the economy, we have found that those are the first uh, programs, initiatives, officers that got eliminated. And so now we're back to traditional, if you will, HR. But, you know, so much has changed in HR. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, Dr. Alicia, that when you were sending out um, uh, resumes over, you had people white out their addresses and their names. Now, are there certain things that, and this is for all of you all, and we'll start with you, Sabrina. Are there certain buzzwords we should stay aware, stay away from? Are there certain, I mean, you know, if I'm applying for a job, are there key words that I need to not include to get to make it through that process at that company? Or is it based on the I, I don't know, you guys are the HR experts. Is it based on the you know, the company. So should you not say that, I don't know, if, if you know a company is just say, hypothetically, they don't believe in same-sex marriages and you say my partner, you know, I, it was this very funny story. Um, at a different company, I had a partner who happened to be a, a white and Cuban guy. Uh, he was mixed. And we would go in places and we would always say, and we were business partners. And we would say, I would say, my partner, my partner, my partner. And we finally went to a social event with, with the company and they assumed that we were partners, like, a, you know, a, a unit, just because that's the word that we use. So then we started to say, okay, no, my business partner. <laughs> so are there certain words that we should stay away from? Let's start with you, Sabrina, go to you, Dr. Alicia, then you, Dr. Vicky. Yeah, so... Unfortunately, no, there's no blanket answer for that, uh, largely because you never know, well, not never, if you can read between the lines of what a job posting says, or what a, you know, speaking to a recruiter, the kind of information, or if you have done the research and found out information about the company, and you can see missions, values, you know, where they maybe donate their money, you can potentially work at playing that game but it's a game because you really never know who you're speaking with. You never know what their values are and how that's going to play into um, the hiring process. And, and so I generally 
advise people to just be themselves because the reality is is that if if you really like play the game correctly the way that the world assumes it to be you could end up in a really horrific job situation you can end up in a company that doesn't value you that if if nothing else might even harm you because you don't align with what they do and what they believe in. Um, and in that sense, actually, I, I do think AI can be really helpful to do your research ahead of time. You can look at their job posting. You can actually drop their job posting into different AI tools and see if it's been copy and pasted from somewhere else or if they've pulled the data from other places um, and, and even get synonyms from AI for how to talk about the job posting without sounding like you're reading directly from the job posting, but still hitting all of those, those pieces. Um, but yeah, it's it's really tough to, to have any kind of blanket statement for that because I can tell you right now, I'm probably going to hire very differently than a lot of other people out there. And I'm going to look for people that use inclusive terms. But if you go somewhere else, those inclusive terms might get you put right on the do not hire pile. So I, you know, I had to piggyback on that, uh, Sabrina, and that was great. And one of the things I was thinking about is how I approach it when I'm working uh, with my uh, clients. Um, and the first thing is I don't believe in the buzzword. So when I'm looking at that resume before I forward it to that director, um, I'm looking at a, does this person align with the mission of the organization? Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly most of my clients are, you know, nonprofits and small business and entrepreneurs. So for me, it is essential that I understand this person on the paper. Uh, because I already know the client that I'm working with, the company or the organization, uh, because I understand the mission. Um, and then next, I really look at their values, you know, and you can really tell uh, uh, through reading that that resume. Um, I do not advise anyone to, to play the game as Sabrina was saying, because you can get really caught up in a very horrific or situation and you have not spent the correct time to find out more about that business. And one of the things I encourage everyone to do is, although they are interviewing you, you should be interviewing them. Do your homework thoroughly. So you'll know their values. You'll know the mission statement. You'll look on it. You can see if they believe in DNI. It's right on the website. If they have an all white board, most likely DNI is far away from what they really know to do when it comes to DNI at that organization. A lot of times they say it, but they don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I I would say be very strategic in when you're trying to apply for organization and align your values with their values, your mission with their mission and study who they are. And it's more success successful for you versus playing the game or looking for buzzwords. Because one word here could mean something else to someone else, like Sabrina said. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Vicky. Yeah, and and um, I I think that why why you already, Mr. Brina and Dr. Alicia has shared is 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 very important. I will also encourage you know candidates to um and and when I review uh, resumes, I basically seek for you know what are the voluntary uh, activities that they have you know participating in, in in the last few years how, how how was their engagement i review their linkedin profile how many connections they have how they what, what are the, their posts about and um also you know in terms of you know leveraging in terms of networking what ne uh what um networks they 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 are part of how um what is the engagement in those networks? And uh, do they have any endorsements in their LinkedIn profile or share in regards to what they're doing? Um, do they act as a mentor for young people? They, you know, are they involved in any DNI initiative um, other than what is reading in their, in their resume? And uh, as I think uh, Alicia mentioned, it is important to do the research, to um, ask questions um, throughout the interview and see how much they have invested 
read uh, their their sustainability report in, in, in their web page, how many uh, initiative, uh, what, what are the future plans of, of the organization and the practice um, they are implementing going forward in order to have a more diverse or more representation in certain areas. What are the goals for the future within two or three years? That will give you a lot of information in regards to the company and see if actually there is an alignment be, be, you know, between the uh, your values and, and the organization itself. Great. You know, um, this, this wasn't part of uh, our discussion and or question, but I think all three of you have mentioned you know, LinkedIn and social media platforms and and that's sort of like your other resume, right? <laughs> you know, because you know, everybody researches it. Now, how important is it to keep those, especially LinkedIn, updated? And are you finding that there are AI tools that are actually writing your LinkedIn profiles for you? All right, so we'll start with you, Dr. Alicia, real very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I, I think having that LinkedIn page is essential because uh, number one thing I do when I get a stack of resumes and the HR ministry is working with me, I say, go on the LinkedIn page for me and and then send me a copy of that LinkedIn page after you reviewed it. Because after I read it, now I need to match what I read on that resume to that LinkedIn page. Um, I don't really look and see if AI you know, created it for them. What I really do is see the alignment there and then see who they know, who they connected to, like Dr. Vicky said. Um, and then I look for the cohesiveness in their their uh, what they send on the resume and really kind of put it together, can they really do the job? So I think LinkedIn is essential for it to be up to date and current. Mm -hmm. Now, do you concur, Sabrina? I do. I I think social media, for good or for ill, is a, a tool in recruiting because you can see who people are. You see what they do. Um, like Dr. Vicky said, you can see what they post and what they comment, how what they think is important to highlight how they connect with people. And you can often get a sense of their values based on what it is they're putting out into the world and what they're consuming, the groups they belong to. Um, I always caution people though, when using LinkedIn as a, as a validation tool, um, because as a business, well, let me back up. As an person, you can put yourself as an employee of any company you want out there on LinkedIn. And as a business, you can't deny them that. You can't take them off. You can't say this person doesn't work for me. And so there is a little bit of a grain of salt of what some people have put on there. And I learned that the hard way as an employer not being able to say this person doesn't work for my company. And when I brought that to LinkedIn, they were like, well, you can message them and ask them to take it off their profile. Yeah. I was like, that's not helpful. So that's actually a spot. I wish that AI, that there was more AI where you could validate that people, what they've put on places is accurate because it also that would help with their resume, right? You know, because people can put whatever they want in front of you. And to speak to what Dr. Alicia said, you have to use that human discernment mm -hmm. to see whether or not they can really do the job. Is what is in front of you an accurate representation of who they are and what they are capable of? Okay, great. Dr. Vicki, want to add anything to that? No, well, I, what I, what I can add is definitely they are right. Um, but LinkedIn, LinkedIn has been, you know, becoming very relevant, and uh, it will not be the only tool that we use in order to make a decision. Definitely, you know, you will have uh, other um, tools, assessments, and and among you know what is the, depending on the process of each company. But definitely, it's becoming well, ninety seven percent, ninety seven percent of the recruiters are using and leveraging um, LinkedIn to make a, or select candidates. And, and, and for the candidates perspective, it, it opens doors, you know, because of networking. Mm -hmm. I will not be able to meet perhaps Sharon because of, 
she 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 actually uh, sent me an invite through LinkedIn in order for for you know to start um, supporting the National Women Collaborative. So because of that, she 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 gave uh, I was able to meet her and and and, and you know three years um, after we are here and having this conversation. So that's the the, the power of 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 social media. Um, so I think it, you have to be mindful um, and but also have the ethical consideration of making just uh, a decision based on, on, on social media. Um, but um, understanding that is, is very relevant and it will become more relevant as um, AI continue developing um, on a basically daily basis. <laughs> right. You know, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Thanks, Dr. Vicky. I will say this. Um, you know, as a woman of a certain age, okay, so, you know, a lot of this technology scares me, you know, because I am of the paper touch field. That's me. Okay. So, and a lot of those qualities and elements are going away, especially in AR, in HR. And because, you know, in the day you've been going for an interview, and you would start talking to someone and then realize you went to the same church or you, you know, you knew their grandmother or whatever. All of those kind of human touches in the beginning process seems to be disappearing. And the same thing with social media, you know, when it was MySpace and all those other ones, platforms, it was really for social, you know, it was to find a, a high school sweetheart or a college friend or whatever. And now they're all business tools, you know? So what would you say to that HR director that is, you know, what piece of advice would you give them that in their recruiting process, if they're, you know, HR director at a company or the person that's looking for the job? Because the days of the touchy feely, how do you get it through the door? if you will, uh, and, and, and wake up all of this new technology? I mean, what, what advice would you give them? Is it more networking? Is it more volunteering? Is it um, aligning yourself with, you know, if you're in the nuclear science, join all the nuclear science groups, you know? So, so you know, Sabrina, I mean, what piece of advice would you give anyone? And I know that's a very broad question, but it's, but it, it is very complicated, you know, the whole process is. is complicated. It, you know, it is complicated, but in some ways, to your point, part of the benefits of that early touch point being human going away is that it increases the ability for DE&I to succeed, right? Because when you look for those initial meetings, when you're looking to have that connection to somebody, you you fall into the traps of hiring the person who is most like you or bringing those people through the organization. And while that works well for us as women and people of color, it's not so great when it's helmed by white men bringing in those same people because they have the same golf course or they go to the same bar or they you know, are on the same block and having barbecues. And so one of my suggestions is really understand your values. That can can be a hard thing for people because in the, the realm of looking for work, they can be desperate. They need a job. Maybe they lost their job or they're having a bad go of their company. But really know what your values are and be vocal about those values. Talk about what matters to you. And then to your point, Sharon, Join groups and communities that align with those values um, and that will put you around other people that have those similar values. You know, one of the things I like to do is work with groups um, and companies that are uh, B certified, right? I like working with companies that give back to the world. And so I will search for groups and companies that are certified B corporations and we'll make a point of reaching out to them to collaborate because that aligns with my values. And part of what 
I'm not a B certified corporation, although I'm looking into doing it myself, but I give back to the world in a, the same way that they do. And so that matters to me. And when people find that out about me, they're like, oh, we want to work with you because you're making the world around you a better place also. So I think that's like probably my biggest piece of advice is, is know your values and then go out and find other people with those same values. Okay, Dr. Vicki, I know you're going to say, what was the question, right? <laughs> yeah, no, but no, I definitely think it is very valuable information because as we navigate this year, it's, it's, it's very challenging. As you heard, many layoffs has, are happening right now. A lot of people are struggling to find work. It has been people, you know, I know people and, and I offer um, career coaching to um, professionals, especially women. And um, they are struggling to find, uh, you know, job and high paying and, and quality jobs. So for me, I think it is just, you know, understanding your value, be authentic and, and also leveraging AI as a tool to stay informed and to also identify what exactly is the company looking. Um, and you may you need to make a list of those 10 companies that you wanted to work with. And, and start engaging with people that work in that company because right now is the network. It's the network that will give you the network um, that actually will open doors for you. That, that person that will actually refer and, and open doors because the amount of candidates that each of the roles are receiving is between 300 to 1,000. Um, so how you compete against that? And um, in order for you to stand out, you will need to de do things differently. So I think it is just um, leveraging in AI and also know your value and be authentic and, and be persistent. It is, it is, it's not a spring, it's a long run. So, you know, before we get to you, Dr. Alicia, you know, I have to piggyback on something that uh, that Vicki said. I know I was looking for a part-time administrative assistant. So I put it out on LinkedIn and I mean, I got something like 800 and some applicants, right? <laughs> I mean, and some of them had PhDs and, uh, and some of them had nothing to do was what I do, what I'm doing, you know? And I was like, okay, this person, A, is not going to stay, okay? And, and B, they just want a job. They don't care, you know, anything. So, mm -hmm. so it's very, very interesting. But, you know, just to talk about the collaborative for a little bit, Vicki and I talked about how we met uh, on LinkedIn and then I was in Puerto Rico and we sat down and we met again. And I actually hired Vicky's company to do my staffing for our conference in, uh, in San Juan. So thank you, Vicki. Her team is wonderful. You're so, welcome. Thank yeah, you. it has been a pleasure working with you. But those are those are the things that perhaps we'll not be able to do because of you know technology. So this is wonderful. Great. Hey, Dr. Alicia, and you can figure out what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I love um, what everyone says, Sabrina and Dr. Vicki, um, and they were channeling everything that I believe in values and being authentic. Um, when Dr. Vicki said that, I just erupt on the inside because so often, just like you said, Sharon, people are just looking for a job. Are you looking for to go to be an added asset or value to that company or I need a paycheck really quick? Uh, fortunate if you've been in HR as long as I have and Dr. Vicky, I've been over like 30 years um, or Sabrina, we can see that. <laughs> so I, my advice to anyone, when you're looking for a job, be authentic in your approach about it. Why are you looking for a job? What added value will you bring to that particular organization? Um, what I really love to do, you know, you look at the LinkedIn page, you look at their resume, you know, you talk it out with your team. And I, I like to do these 15 minute pre-screen because now I need to see your face. I need to see if it really isn't aligned with what I've been seeing uh, way before I give it to the directors or the hiring managers. Because then um, in HR, at this level, you got to have a good sense of people you gotta be you gotta you you gotta listen to your gut 
And my 15 minutes with you is going to really tell me, oh, you're just looking for a paycheck and you want to waste Sharon's time. Uh, or you really are what you say you can do on that paper. Um, again, I, I know uh, Sabrina and, and, and Dr. Vicky said, people can put anything on a piece of paper. And they can put anything on that LinkedIn page. And, and so I, I understand that. And when we, you're at HR, you, you be prepared to how you're going to deal with that because we know that exists. We can't change it. And we, we shouldn't even be in a position to want to change it. We should, as leaders in HR, specifically at that high level, understand how we need to navigate to keep all of that out for our clients or for the organization. So being authentic is essential to me and then having those values aligned. And, and it, that 800 that you got would easily go to 20 people <laughs> because you got to wipe out all the garbage out. Right. You know, you talk about being authentic. Um, uh, you know, I've always been an entrepreneur for the most part, but there, I guess probably about 10 years ago, I said, you know what? I am tired of this. It was way too much. And okay, I want to take my skills and go work for someone. So I went to this organization and the woman said, well, why do you want to work with me? I said, you know, I like, because at the time I was doing events and I said, events is my passion. That's what I do. I love it, love it, love it. I said, but you know what? I have a lot of government contracts and I am tired of not getting a consistent paycheck. <laughs> and do you know what? She hired me. And then I said to her after about four months of being there as an employee, I said, you know, I've been on my own for so long. I love what I'm doing here, but I don't need to come to the office every day to do this. I think I should become a contractor. And she said, Sharon, I've never had an employee come to me and say, hey, hire me because I need a paycheck, a consistent paycheck. And now I don't want you to hire me for the consistent employee paycheck. I want you to pay me as a contractor. But <clears throat> my point is I was very authentic. I was authentic with, with this uh, particular company. And even when I left the company, they changed values a little bit from what I wanted to do. Uh, I ran a national women's tour for this organization and about two months in, uh, you know, they changed directions a little bit. Um, I'm trying not to say when Trump was coming about, but I'll just say, but after, you know, new campaign season. And she said to me, she's a Sharon, I don't want to talk to, uh, I only want to talk to um, suburb because we traveled all over the country doing sort of these focus groups. And she said, I only want to talk to suburban women. Well, when you tell an inner city black woman that you only want to talk to suburban women, that means white, okay? <laughs> and, and so you're ruling out urban women, you're ruling out rural women. So you only want to talk to the ones that live in the gated communities. <laughs> so so we parted ways, which was fine. So, but my, my point was that you do have to be true to who you really are because I think it just makes for a better environment for all of for everyone. And I think the three of you said it beautifully that even whether you're an employee or an employer, you know, transparency and honesty is key for, for anybody's success. Uh, you know, sometimes the larger the companies, they're not as transparent. <laughs> but, um, but again, but, you know, our time is up, unfortunately, but we, we have recorded this, so it will be out on in our groups today, um, LinkedIn, not, not, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook. I will make sure that you get a copy of it. Our Women's Wednesday series, um, our next one is February 21st. It is Show Me the Money. It's all about making money, getting money, and keeping money. Okay, so, and then our in March, we're talking midlife entrepreneurs. Uh, we have podcast host, uh, Marcella, who is, should I lost, I quit my job. <laughs> so, uh, and then, so that should be very interesting, but more importantly, save the date, market calendars, more information is coming out. 
We're going back to Puerto Rico for part three. So it is We Mean Business Summit Trace uh, for uh, Sabrina and uh, Dr. Alicia. You know, all of my Puerto Rican sisters, they really, really get on me because they're like, Sharon, you spend so much time in Puerto Rico and you cannot speak Spanish. <laughs> And so I tell them the only words that I know in Spanish were from my college friends uh, and they were all curse words. So I don't think they want me saying those. <laughs> but again, thank you. We'll share your LinkedIn profiles with our, with our group. And again, just thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, for, thank the you for having me. Here. I can't wait till the conference. <laughs> Wonderful. See you there. Looking yeah. forward to see you all in Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay, you. Vicky, we're not talking to you today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Take care of yourself. All right, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank uh -huh. you.